Um, welcome, everybody, to our session today. Um, we are going to be talking about the technological challenges uh, facing cities across the world. So I think we can really lead this into a very broad uh, discussion on, on all sorts of things. Um, we've got a great global panel here. Uh, we've got people from uh, representing cities. We've got um, a private sector company. And we've got the European Commission represented. So we've got a really wonderful broad um, section. What I'm going to do is very briefly introduce um, our panel and ask each of them um, a different question. And then we'll move it into a much more broad discussion. <coughs> but first of all, let me introduce Steve Leonard. He's executive deputy chairman of Infocom Development Authority of Singapore. Minerva Tandako, who is um, uh, New York City's first chief technology officer, is yes, that right? Yes, that's yeah. right. OK. Uh, Ingrid van um, Engelshoven, who is deputy mayor, and she's responsible for um, knowledge economy, uh, international youth, and education for the city of The Hague. Uh, here we have Eduardo Navarro, uh, who is chief commercial digital officer at Telefonica. And at the end here, we have Jesus Villasante, who I'm very pleased to say gave me a much shorter version of his title <laughs> than he originally had, uh, which is Head of um, Net Innovation at the European Commission. So welcome to all the panel. And I'm going to start here with Steve. Um, Steve, tell us a little bit about the approach of Singapore and um, you know, what you're drawing on other cities, but also how Singapore is, is different from, from uh, what other cities are doing. OK. So, uh the scenario that we're facing in Singapore is the same thing that countries, cities, governments around the world are facing, which is big trends such as an aging population, increasing urban density, mean that we have to consider healthcare and transportation and energy and food in a new way. And what we want to do is bring together our startup ecosystem, our university and education community, our investment community, government, of course, which is part of the team that I'm representing, and the corporate environments. If we can bring all of those different parts of the ecosystem together to work on some common problems, whereas today there's much more of a fracturing, we'd like to work more coherently on some of these problems, then we believe that will position Singapore to be not only working on its own needs, but to be a contributor to the global economy. That's why we're calling this a smart nation initiative, because for us, city and nation are the same thing in Singapore. So this is something that we're very focused on. And from that, we have a number of new initiatives underway. And so we'll be talking about some of that during the course of the panel, I'm sure. Mm, and I'm just going to follow up very briefly on that. I mean, because uh, I'm very interested, what are the advantages and maybe disadvantages of being a city and a nation versus something like New York or Paris? Well, if you take a look at some of the things like the Global Innovation Index, not surprisingly, some of the leading places in the world tend to be the smaller places. So Singapore or Finland, Switzerland, mm -hmm. for example. So sometimes constraint is a positive. Mm -hmm. So because we are a small place or uh, a nimble place, that also makes us have to think about things in a variety of ways that we hope are also important and creative. So sometimes not having too much of something also forces you to think a little bit more clearly. So if you look at the top 10 for global innovation, from memory, about six or seven tend to be the smaller countries in which mm. we're one. Right, it's having that sort of, uh, you can draw, draw a line around it, that it's, helps. It's a scenario it? of we have to, so we will. <laughs> we must do, so we will. So it's not an option for us. We, we simply have to focus and get on with some of these things. Yeah, yeah. Well, now Minerva, very, very different city, New York. Um, and despite my accent, I, I'm, I'm a fellow New Yorker as well. Um, so I'm aware of, of, of uh, the challenges that New York faces. Um, now, you're, you know, as New York's first sort of chief technology officer, I wanted to ask you, why is it important to have such a a position. Um, we, you know, we're talking about technology here, but there's also the managing of it. Um, tell us a little bit about how that position came about and, and, and what that means for New York having a CTO. Yeah, so um, actually the uh, creation of the chief technology officer role was part of Mayor, the candidate Bill de Blasio's platform. Um, and as he was elected, um, he appointed me last year uh, Mayor de Blasio created the role in order to help coordinate a citywide tech strategy. Mm -hmm. And this is really um, a very bold visionary step on, on the mayor's part because he recognizes that ultimately 
that government is the next sort of place to be um, transformed through digital technology, mm. not only in how government delivers its government services, but also in how it engages its citizens and in the wider tech sector. So this role is fairly broad in terms of its um, oversight, but its specific role is to coordinate across all of the many agencies in the city. There's mm -hmm. 70 of them, there's 50 CIOs. Um, and so uh, it really is to develop that coordinated strategy. So, so a big piece of my role is to help um, assure that all of our many technology initiatives are coordinated to a common strategy. And our smart city strategy is um, a smart city is an equitable city. Mm -hmm. Just uh, w one of my favorite quotes is um, William Gibson, who said, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I think part of government's role and challenge and obligation is to assure that the future is evenly distributed, mm -hmm. and that we use technology for the greater social good. So we've got a lot of initiatives we can talk about, but we're building the, the, the largest free municipal Wi-Fi, um, Link NYC in the city. We're working with neighborhoods to build an neighborhood innovation labs with a special lens in all of our policy and planning to assure that the underserved communities in particular benefit from the smart city initiatives that we're doing. Right, right. And just a quick follow-up question for you. I mean, New York, um, certainly in the context of, of the US, but also generally, is, I mean, compared to a lot of cities, it's an old city, it's got old infrastructure. Um, what are the challenges there of, of dealing with that compared to, say, a newer city? Yes, there's many, many, uh, especially with the um, uh, older infrastructure. New York is going to have its 400th birthday in 2025. Um, and we have many amazing infrastructure systems like our water system and trains that are over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we've deployed, we've employed the method of clever reuse of existing infrastructure. Mm. So turning the old payphones into free Wi-Fi mm. hotspots is a perfect example of that. It's already got electricity and wire running to it. Why not just turn those into Wi-Fi hotspots? Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. I think that's a great initiative. Um, Ingrid, uh, I, I'm really interested to talk to you about some of the, um, you've got such an interesting remit, uh, you know, youth education. Um, you're, it's sort of the people side of all of this. Um, you know, we, and we talk a lot, um, you know, at, at forums like this on, you know, technology and how technology is transforming society. Um, but, you know, are we, are we paying enough attention to the, the human side, the urban development? Um, talk a little bit about that from your perspective. Well, I think uh, um, for a city, well, technology is not the biggest challenge. Uh, um, in a city like The Hague, we have uh, more than 150 nationalities living in our uh, uh, city. We have an aging population. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, uh, big issues, uh, uh, um, intentions between uh, uh, boroughs. And I think the main challenge is how, uh, in all the challenges we have, how do we make sure our city stays inclusive? Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone uh, uh, gets a chance to participate and um, people get more autonomy in their borough. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, get the feeling that uh, they're on the steering wheel and not uh, the government, the central government is, or a technology company is, because I think that's the worst that could happen, that they have the feeling, well, the technology companies are taking over my borough, my city. Mm. Um, so what we have to take care of is make sure that um, young people uh, uh, age in a city uh, and grow up in a city where they get a feeling, well, uh, I'm invited to think about mm -hmm. public space. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm invited to think about the transport system. Mm -hmm. I'm invited to, uh, uh, um, uh, to think with the deputy mayor about the education system. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's, um, we have great new opportunities to make cities more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big challenge is how to use uh, uh, those opportunities mm -hmm. and, um, and therewith strengthen democracy. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it comes with a very big challenge for local government too, because uh, uh, we tend to govern in silos. So we have the guys from transportation, uh, we have the, uh, the ladies from welfare and from health, and they have to learn to work together uh, mm. and to look at um, 
uh, neighborhoods and parts of city as integrated systems. Mm -hmm. And um, well, that's really a big challenge for governance too. Yes, yeah. And, and are you seeing, I mean, you know, the, you, you mentioned young people there and, and the role that they play, this is the wired generation. Are you mm -hmm. seeing um, them as a sort of source of innovation as well? Yes, I do, and, and what uh, 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 I organize in, in city are um, youth labs. So mm. we invite young people to come to the library and um, they uh, can play games. Uh, so uh, we do a serious gaming with them to um, let them develop policy with me. Right. And, uh, uh, and that's great to see. And it's uh, uh, great to see that they are so enthusiastic and they have really good ideas. Mm. And I think uh, with young people, it's... Uh, um, they, they love it. The biggest challenge uh, lies with the elderly, uh, who we have to ma really make uh, smart in the, in the digital world still. And sure. uh, with a lot of from our elderly people who can't even read or write, um, that's really a challenge. Mm -hmm. We have so many stakeholders in a city. Uh, bringing them all together is always is always difficult. And Eduardo, I'd like to ask you a little bit about that as a as a telecoms company. Um, how do you see your role? And talk a little bit about um, you know interacting with with different stakeholders from citizens to government. Okay, I think at the first point now we see ourselves as a, as an actor, but in an ecosystem. Now I think that uh, in order to build a, a smart city, it requires different actors. And I think that the Hawaii Telco, it's important. The first one is that this is, no one doubts, this is going to be the gateway to the smart city. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, every reaction that we're going to have to, to, a, to a smart city has to be done through a, a smartphone. I think that the second uh, reason is that everything in a smart city, I think, has to be connected. You know, the sensors, everything has to be connected. And uh, we are Telco now, we are, I think we are the natural supplier of connectivity. But I think that our role now at least uh, Telephone, we have this aspiration, goes beyond connectivity. I think that we have a, now you tend to, you are, you like to play a role on, on the platform level. And I think when you're seeing a platform for a smart seats, I think there are some basic principles that if I manage a smart seats, I'll be very concerned about. The first one is interoperability. You see, mm -hmm. I think that everything that you build for New York in terms of application should be able to be used in Barcelona or in Sao Paulo or in Tokyo. No? So it's very important that you can replicate this. And the second one for me, it's, uh, it's uh, portability. So, I think that if I develop an infrastructure, I think that uh, I will not accept it to be, to be, I don't know, to be linked to a unique provider. So, I think that uh, someone that's managed, I don't know, a 10 years project for a city, I think uh, it's very important that you can portable from one supplier to the other. And I think this is our DNA of telecommunication. So, I think that uh, as part of our life, a client for a telephone operator, I have to talk with client, client operator B, Otherwise, our service is not going to work. And the second one is in terms of portability. If my app with my supplier, I can take my number and I can go to another provider. I think that those kind of, uh, of, uh, of principles no, have to be applied on this. I think this is, again, this is our DNA of telecommunication providers. And I think even going beyond this, no, not only have set connectivity platform, but I think even we think about uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, vertical solutions. No? See, again, we are working hard on this. And uh, it's again in terms of mobility. That's uh, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's basic on data. No, that's uh, I think that's uh, every single smart city will be built around data. I think that uh, again, as a telecommunication provider, you have access to a huge amount of data. Uh, it's, I think it's very important. I think that uh, you use. I think that we at telecoms you have uh, the trust that uh, every data that you use to manage, you're managing. Uh, I would say respecting privacy. Right. No one is expecting that your calls are going to be listed by mm -hmm. a telco operator. Yep. No, that yep. I think gives us some kind of basic conditions to aspire to play this role again with uh, the other, the other actors. Yes, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about about privacy um, later on in the discussion. Um, uh, but I wanted to move on to Jesus now. I mean, we're, we're talking, uh, and we, this, we touched on this earlier in, in what some of the previous speakers have said. Um, that it's not just about the technology, it's about um, human development as well. But um, I, tell us a little bit about why, why you see technology platforms as so critical to all of this. Well, <clears throat> yes, in fact, um, I have heard in this uh, conference, in previous sessions, something that is key for smart cities, that it is the efficiency of the public sector and the services that are provided um, to the citizens. And that is key, that is clearly the objective. But this cannot happen without the appropriate technology. Therefore, to me, the choice of the technology is a strategic choice uh, for the city. 
is something that cannot be delegated to the IT department. The platform that a city chooses is something that is going to determine the future prospects of the city, to ensure that the city is not smart today only, but is smarter every day, meaning that the platform has to be interoperable, has to be open, has to promote innovation um, in the city. Um, therefore, a, in a way, the platform is going to be the DNA of the city. It's going to transmit, the, it is going to be the nervous system, in a way. It's going to transmit the orders, it's going to communicate every services. And if you don't have a platform that allows that, then you are really not investing in the future. That is the first point. The second reason <clears throat> is because cities are not isolated. Cities are connected more and more to other cities. And this element of interoperability, of portability, is indispensable. Finally, uh, we realize that uh, uh, smart city platforms, they are an engine for innovation. They are not just providing services. It is a mechanism to attract other people, to attract entrepreneurs, to support innovation ecosystems in the city. Therefore, I think that if the cities have also that objective, it is indispensable that they have a platform that is open, because that would generate open innovation involving everyone, involving the public sector, involving industry, and especially involving startups and SMEs that are very dynamic on innovation. Mm. So, in summary, yes, I believe that the technology, especially the service platform, is a key ingredient for smart city. Yeah, yeah, we're going to come back to that, I think. Uh, but just briefly before I leave, I think it might be interesting for people to hear um, what is the role of the European Commission in all of this in, in the smart cities? Well, the smart cities is a very strong development that is <clears throat> happening recently. The cities have a major socioeconomic impact in, uh, in the world, and uh, therefore, for the European Commission, it's an important. A, a topic. We wouldn't like that in Europe, every city develops their own system, that at the end they are not uh, connected, that they are replicated, that they are spending the money in not the best efficient way. So in Europe, we have um, in the European Commission three main initiatives. One is called the European Innovation, Pla um, a, a Innovation, a European Innovation Partnership. The idea there is to, to put together industry, city and citizens to improve the quality of services and to improve the uh, services provided by uh, the city. That is one activity. There is another activity on Light Hub projects that promotes the development uh, of the, I mean, the implementation of uh, technology in the cities. And there is another one that is very interesting that is providing solutions. And in this uh, aspect of providing solutions, the European Commission has been supported very strongly uh, Fiverr. Fiverr is an open technology platform that is supported by companies, by large companies, and it is now taking up very much in cities. There are, at this moment, 75 cities in Europe that are supporting uh, Fiverr. And we believe that the characteristics, not necessarily uh, that technology, but the characteristics of openness and interoperability are going to gain traction uh, worldwide. Mm. So for us in the European Commission, uh, smart cities are very important. Right, right. Now, you, you talked there a bit about the importance of technology platforms and these big investments that, that uh, cities are making. And I mean, you know, we have a, a huge expo out here with very large IT companies, um, you know, ready to sell um, huge amounts of equipment to cities. Um, what are the challenges, I'd like to ask all of you, um, the challenges of making those investments given that, you know, technology changes in a heartbeat and that something that you bought one year is no longer relevant the next year. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with Minerva because you mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the um, turning the, the, the old pay phones into um, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi hubs. Um, how have you built flexibility into that? Yeah, so, um, you know, many of these uh, large franchises, so our pay phones are a franchise that we grant to a company, we first did a kind of inverted RFP in which we said, give us your best proposals for turning the payphones into Wi-Fi hotspots. Mm. Instead of saying, this is our design, give us your lowest bid. Mm. Um, and so we ended up, I think, with a much better design. We also ended up with a solution which doesn't cost the taxpayers any money, mm. where the money is generated by advertising and actually will produce revenue. But the technological challenge with many of these agreements, they're 10 to 15 years long. And if you think about 10 years ago, it was 2005, the iPhone didn't exist, right? right. Um, and so 
um, when you create these contracts, you have to build that flexibility into the contract. So in our case, we built in two technology refreshes required by the contract, which in involved not only uh, modularizing the technology that would make it easy to upgrade components of these kiosks, but also the security and software needs to be readily upgradable. Um, and um, we, we anticipated that we're going to be upgrading the software in these, and those can be done centrally as well. Instead mm -hmm. of having to go out to eight to 10,000 of these right. units, uh, we'll be able to upgrade the software centrally. So to the extent that you can um, predict the future, you can always predict that it will be different. Right, right, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn to Steve now. I mean, how, how is Singapore building in this kind of flexibility into, uh, into what it does? And, and is it easier being this uh, very sort of self-contained uh, city nation? Um, no, it's not easier. <laughs> I, I guess the scenario is all of us represent globally connected cities, as I think we were talking about a second ago. So there isn't anything that makes it easier or more difficult, I would say. But here's the way that I'd like to frame our thinking, is we're trying to be better at understanding that no matter how much flexibility we might wish to design in, and no matter how hard we try to think about open exits and entrances to new technologies, we also need to be better at saying it's inevitable that some of the things along the way will become obsolete or replaced or upgraded. So there is sometimes a, a level of angst that says, if I only wait six more months, this new X will come out. So whether the X is networking equipment or storage or servers or anything else in the food chain, it will because every company, I've, I've spent my whole career in tech companies until now, Every tech company spends a huge amount of time and effort on R&D or it wouldn't exist. So everything will become obsolete and roll over. Our challenge is not to let that paralyze us from taking some actions now that can improve things now and then make sure that we don't lock in. So we are trying to be better at saying, what's the next step? But the counterpoint is, please let's continue to take some action because it's far too easy to say, if we just wait a bit longer, I'm sure the new X of whatever will come out. Mm -hmm. And that just defers and delays because inevitably by the time you get there, something else is around the corner. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be better at two things. Thinking about it's okay to experiment and explore and some things work and some don't and you discard and move on. And number two is we're trying to be better at building internally. So we're not trying to have mass procurement in everything we do. We're trying to very much encourage young students in Singapore, young startups in Singapore, universities in Singapore, R&D centers to contribute to moving things along versus just having a beauty pageant of a variety of vendors come in and say, here's my amazing product. So we're trying to take what's out there and we're trying to also add some IP to it. That's part of our national challenge is to use this window of opportunity as a moment of re-inspiring and reinvigorating. Right, yeah. I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Eduardo as, as, as an IT provider. Um, tell us a little bit about um, how your, uh, your partnerships with, with governments and how you're building in flexibility to, to those deals. Yeah, we, are, we are supporting very stimulously all these initiatives from the European Union, from the Fireware, for this concept of open platform. We don't know what uh, technology will be in place in three or four years from now, but we are 100% sure that it will not be an existing technology, it will be something new. And I see that uh, now we work, uh, it's everything that we are working with, uh, with uh, cities, you know, with municipalities, with governments, including, not only the, you know, including the European Commission, is to foster those kind of platforms that are very flexible, that allows portability, that allows... Uh, uh, I think that we cannot uh, repeat on on a, on a city some of the you know, some of the things that happen, for instance, uh, to us as individuals. Now, for instance, if we, I see that uh, this concept of rating systems that do not talk to each other mm -hmm. cannot exist in a smart cities. For instance, if I have my life on uh, iOS and I decide to migrate to uh, to uh, to an Android, most of my life, my music, uh, it's uh, I cannot move. And I think those kind of uh, not. Uh, this, this existence of portability cannot happen in a city. If I imagine that you can deploy in New York or in a, or in a, or in a very big city, everything in one platform, and then you decide to move to another platform, you cannot be unblocked, you cannot be blocked in one platform. And I think this is the, the, the concept that we are working, again, very extensively with the European community. 
to, to foster development in this, in this, in this area mm -hmm. of a freedom of portability of things that you can move from one provider to the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I think something what Steve said is very important if it comes to government is what we have to uh, leave behind for a part is the, the big procru procurement and um, um, actually what we have to do is uh, put a challenge on the market. Mm. Uh, 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 not a solution, but a challenge on the market and um, enhance that uh, not only big corporations but also small startups, uh, uh, universities, uh, knowledge institutes work together in a kind of city lab environments uh, uh, to provide us of a solution and that in that system it will remain kind of flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what we do now in uh, uh, Scheveningen, it's uh, the Hague Beach, uh, the, the Hague Beach area. Um, well, in, 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 in summer it gets very crowded so we, we, we're looking at for smart city solutions to uh, uh, control traffic, uh, to uh, make sure that not everyone leaves at the same time, uh, uh, to uh, uh, make sure that uh, restaurants uh, uh, get uh, their, their public every day uh, and through, during the day, and doing it with the citizens, with uh, uh, the SMEs uh, uh, around there, uh, uh, with knowledge institutes, with uh, uh, big companies, make sure that you get an, a, a system that's more flexible and is not a, a, a fixed uh, solution. Right, right. So we're, it's a, a movable feast, as, yeah. as we say. <laughs> um, so, uh, Jesus, you were, the, you were talking about platforms. Um, you know, give us your view on how we build flexibility into, into our future. Okay. I think that this is uh, very much linked uh, to the comments that you made before about what are the technological challenges today in the, in the city. And many people said that the technology is not a big challenge. Yeah. And that is correct, but it is a challenge. And it is a challenge, and I'm going to refer to three of them that are important, that all the cities are working on them, but that the solution is not solved. The first one is uh, connecting the silos, connecting the verticals. All cities are now moving to see how this is done, and basically the solution is to have a service platform. We have talked about uh, it very much, but I think that it is also important to realize that this election of the service platform, of this horizontal platform, is something that will not lock the city in for the future. So that is one point. The second point that it is a technological challenge is opening the data. And all the cities are doing that, but I am concerned if there will be no standards uh, of any kind that would allow this data to be used in a transparent way by everyone. Uh, the third thing, it deals with having intelligent services. And this is connected with the data. Because when we talk about data, we are assuming that the data, more static, more historic, uh, more historic is easy to be uh, opened. But what is essential now is to open real-time data. And this is a challenge, to know what is happening in this moment with all the functions of the city. And in fact, services, if you want to implement an intelligent service, an advanced service, there is going to be no smart services that do not know about the context. This will not happen anymore. Whatever service will have to know where they are situated, where, what are the conditions, and in order to do that, you need real-time data. So to me, there are still challenges uh, to be solved. Yeah, yeah. And no. by the way, you were asking about um, uh, flexibility. Mm. This is what will give real flexibility to the city to accommodate to the different circumstances, to the different moments yeah. uh, in the city. Yeah. You, you mentioned there, I mean, um, the open data and, uh, you know, smart cities are very much, you know, being built on this uh, concept of open data. Um, we, you know, as we're all very much aware, um, certainly right now, you know, we're living in a very, very increasingly dangerous world. I, I thought we'd perhaps talk a little bit about um, the tension between open data and, and, the, and the smart city and the need for security. Um, who would like, was there, I would just throw it out to the group now, would, um, who'd like to start with that one? Sure, I think... Um you know, an approach to a lot of this when, I, when we talk about a citywide tech strategy is to start with the principles that you would like all decisions to be made according to. So um, <clears throat> in this case, security and privacy are a key principle of what we do. New York City has um, the uh, largest open data portal in the United States. We have several hundred data sets um, available there, but um, that is very carefully curated to assure that um, we are protecting the anonymity of where the, the data is 
come from. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it takes a bit longer to get the data out uh, to expose it. On the inside of the government, we're also working to make sure that people build their data sets to be shareable so that you can predefine what is shareable and what is not. Right. And it's not this extra step you right. know, when it comes time to publish that data. Yeah. So that principle of shareability, um, it's much more expensive to, to put an elevator on a 100-story building at the end, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so if you know up front that you're going to share it, then you right. can build your data structure uh, accordingly. So really sort of essentially pre-classification of the, of the data uh, before sharing it. Yes. And I see yeah. that most yeah. of the data to be shared have to be anonymized. Mm -hmm. Now we have to share aggregated numbers and not individual mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think those yeah. concepts can, 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 can be compatible. Yeah. And there's, well, the, and there's a big difference in, in having all these uh, 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 open data and big data and giving people real access uh, uh, to the data because um, uh, you have to create uh, 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 dashboards and, and, and uh, give people real access and um, uh, give them tools to understand the data and make them their own and um, um, tell them how they can use it and uh, what they mean. Uh, so having all these data um, doesn't mean necessarily that as a, as a government or as companies you are very transparent uh, because the more data you have, uh, uh, well, it's, it's like a haystack, uh, it, gets, it gets less transparent. So you um, have to guide people in what are you looking for and what do you want to know and uh, create good tools for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that makes government real transparent. Right. And for us as politicians, that's, that's a challenge because you're far more exposed, uh, uh, can be far more exposed than ever before. Mm. Uh, uh, that's a challenge, but also a big opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of citizen awareness building, as, as, yeah. as you were saying, yeah. Um, Steve, I don't know if you want to, to chime in on this sort of the, the, the tension between security and openness. I, I think it's a tricky one. I think the, the most important thing is as long as we're speaking about it, as long as people are open and honest about it, so the recent events just remind everyone that there is always going to be a need for data to be pursued for, for use by governments because at the end of the day, one of the primary objectives for any government is to ensure the safety of its citizens. So there is this debate about how much is too much. When we were speaking prior to this uh, panel, our shared view was understanding the purpose that the data is being used for is an important level of transparency for citizens. So if the idea is, I need this data, it's important to have the dialogue for the purpose of X, and then there needs to be consequences for misuse of data by whomever. And so using data in a meaningful way in order to improve something or protect something makes sense to most of the people most of the time. It's when it's misused or non-transparent, the, the use of it, that people become anxious. But I think it's just inevitable that with all the things going on around all of us all the time, that data has to continue to be used in a meaningful way. We just need to be clear about for what purpose, and if it's misused, what's the consequence? Mm, absolutely. Um, Jesus, do you have comments on, on this topic? Well, <clears throat> I think that on that matter, certainly there are aspects of regulation, but there are also aspects of implementation, how people implement a, a data publishing that is uh, respectful with the privacy of, uh, of people. Uh, now in Europe there is a very interesting initiative that is the, uh, called the Open and Agile Smart Cities. This is an initiative that involves already 75 um, cities. It's an initiative of the cities themselves and what they have is a, an open data model. So this means that these cities are committed to a publish the data in such a way that it can be used uh, by anybody, and that at the same time is respectful to issues of privacy. This is not just an European initiative, it's something in which uh, cities from Australia, from Brazil are already joining, just uh, cities from China and India are very, interesting, very interested. So I think that, uh, yes, it is something very important, the way in which the data is treated, and I think that it is also advisable that the cities take a step on that matter and that the step that they take is coordinated. That is why, to me, the, this initiative of Open and Agile Smart Cities is very, very promising. Mm, absolutely. And I think, Sarah, just briefly to add on a point, we always talk about privacy or protection, but it's also important to segregate protecting data and protecting individuals. 
So you can protect data from breach or misuse, and there's lots of different ways to think about that. But there's also the important point of protecting the individuals or the pri privacy of the individual as compared to this idea that the individual and the data of the individual are always the same. Mm -hmm. There's traffic data, environmental data, there's lots of data that is not prescribed necessarily to an individual. And then there's individual data, which is much more sensitive, medical records, financial records. Mm -hmm. So how do we protect the person and how do we protect the data as opposed to this sort of one generic term talking about data protection. I think that's such an interesting point, and I think actually that's going to become increasingly difficult as, as we as humans just sort of become data. <laughs> um, it's something that will, will need to be put into, into place. Um, I'm going to ask the panel one more question. I think we're going to have, uh, I'm going to move then to um, uh, audience questions. We've got um, mics around, so uh, if you're ready with your questions, um, we'll be moving on to that shortly. But one of the things um, I wanted to get to, we've talked a lot about the you know, importance of technology platforms. I'd like to sort of turn it around a bit here and talk about um, you know, p the, the human side behind this. And I remember many years ago when writing about something we used to call e-government. Um, <laughs> we had cities talking about, you know, these seamless platforms, and then you found that, lo and behold, behind these platforms, you know, the, the departments were just as sort of siloed as ever. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the sort of governance behind this, the, the, the structures, what needs to be in place for this to really happen now that we, we need so much more collaboration between, you know, whether it's telecoms and, and, and the energy department. Um, uh, perhaps Steve, I'll start. I'll start with you yeah, on th that. Th this is uh, this is an easy one to, to speak about, and obviously difficult to try and accomplish in reality. But part of what we're working on in Singapore is to have, back to this theme of smart nation, is the prime minister has appointed one of his cabinet ministers to serve as a coordinating minister across all ministries. And so when you think about healthcare and an aging population, inevitably you have to also think about transportation because moving someone from where they are to their caregiver for an 84-year-old that needs a different level of care, those two have to work in harmony. So you cannot have health think about its issues and transport think about its issues without coming together in more of a team effort. So part of our goal is to say, how do we think of this under this umbrella? And that's why there has been a, a minister, he was here with us yesterday actually at an event in, in this uh, hall, talking about Smart Nation is to say, all the different parts of Team Singapore, Team Gov, have to play together. Now that means sharing of data, that means thinking about who gets access to what. So if we're thinking about this level of health and this level of transport, but there isn't a harmonization or a standard protocol of who can see what, then that falls down. Mm -hmm. So the head of the civil service has regular meetings every two weeks to bang heads together and say, who's cooperating, who's playing nicely, who needs a bit of coaching, so it's a real consistent push that we're striving for. Mm, absolutely. Um, Minerva, I think, did you say 70 mm. departments that yes. you were dealing with? <laughs> yeah, um, tell us a little bit about, about that, that particular <laughs> challenge. <laughs> well, you know, and, and as is true in The Hague, I think it's true, uh, government has silos. Mm. And a big piece of um, my role is to help uh, break down those silos. And we do this a number of different ways through um, technology steering committee, which directly links operations, strategy, and budget. Mm -hmm. So I think you really need to have those three in sync to make sure that you're actually investing your technology spend in a strategic way mm -hmm. and that it's a forcing function in many ways um, uh, to, to govern the technology spend in, in the same strategic direction. We also have um, a number of multi-agency initiatives ones in which we must work together or it won't be successful. Mm -hmm. And so we manage those centrally. I sit in City Hall, um, and so I have a view across all the mm -hmm. agencies, all the major projects, all the strategic initiatives, mm -hmm. and can note where there are overlaps, synergies, or conflicts, mm -hmm. and help to sort of un unravel uh, those conflicts as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So I think that governance piece is, is right, it's spot on, because um, you can have a great vision, but in order to implement it, you have to have a coordinated plan. Mm, absolutely, and, and I think um, it's becoming apparent as we're seeing more of these types of positions appearing that you need that, uh, you need mm -hmm. that, that, that big picture uh, person. 
Um, Ingrid, you're not a, a CTO, but I mean, tell us a little bit about you know your role as 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 being taking charge of these very different areas of government. Well, it's uh, uh, well, it is uh, uh, difficult. I, I think it's one of the biggest challenges uh, a government stands for because y yes, there are still the silos, and uh, uh, in the Netherlands and also in the Hague, we not only have uh, the silos in our bureaucracy, but we also have. Uh, coalitions. So mm -hmm. I, I work with five different political parties uh, in the city of The Hague and we all have to agree. So, and every party wants to have his role and uh, um, uh, his view on, on things. And that makes it very difficult to have uh, a coordinating role. And uh, um, if you have this uh, uh, in politics, this coordinating role, well, you're always a pity one. Oh, oh my God, uh, uh, you have a, a coordinating portfolio and you have to work. With, but with I believe the solution is to uh, uh, get society in uh, City Hall because um, citizens no longer accept uh, that we are uh, working in, in silos. Mm. They see what happens in traffic management, they see what happens in, in the healthcare, and they don't understand uh, if the possibilities are there, why don't you do it uh, in a coordinated, integrated uh, solution. So um, stimulating that dialogue and uh, um, putting citizens more in uh, will help us to uh, face our own challenge, I right, believe. Right, right, yeah. Now, I mean, we, we often think of uh, government as the, as the ones w uh, facing the silos and, and uh, the bureaucracy, but um, Eduardo, uh, talk a little bit about that from the private sector yes, view. Yes. Uh, uh, with shifting technologies, are you having to shift the hierarchy of the com company? Uh, it's a very interesting uh, situation because we as advocations at tech companies, we are selling those kind of solutions no, to certain companies, to, to, to cities. And uh, we are facing tough times in trying to use this internally. And uh, we have our headquarters in Madrid. It's, uh, it's like a city, no? we call this street to city, it's the street of communications. We have more than 15,000 employees or visitors working there. We have uh, 15 buildings, we have uh, 7,000 uh, parking uh, places. We have uh, like a health center, it's, it's this very small city. And uh, it's very tough, has been very tough to implement this there. First of all, because you have to agree for people for security, they have their own priorities. People from human resource, they have a completely different priorities for control attendance for employees. People from the facilities management, they have, a, again, they have a, each of them have their, 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 their systems, have their priorities, has been very difficult to talk with all of them uh, until our major, that's our CEO, appointed someone responsible for this, to take responsibility for this. And even after this, I see that all the regulation have been provided to the older systems. For, for instance, in order to implement the smart parking. Now, uh, our human resource department, they, they, until now, they, they said to us that uh, each employee have the right to have an established place that is in this place, cannot be that one. Then we cannot implement a smart park solution no, without rotate, without rate responsibility for this. That requires human, uh, the human resource department to change the established law. It's measured this, if it's difficult for doing this in a private company with, I don't know, 15 employees, imagine a big city with five uh, parties with uh, five million people, the complexity is huge. Then again, I think that for me, the technology is not going to be the bearer. The technology is very important, but I think that the bearers are going to be, the silos are going to be how we change the established Rules. I see if you are able to change this, and I'm very happy because I'll see that each more and more and more you see here when you come to for like this CTOs for a city. Now I think that five or ten years ago this doesn't exist, mm -hmm. and I think this is going to make uh, things going much faster than the pure technology. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'd actually for, from from you, Hesus, I'd like you to talk a little bit about perhaps. Um, in the intercity uh, collaborations and um, uh, our, our cities' islands, and how, you know how how are you seeing them starting to learn lessons from each other? Okay, <clears throat> uh, first in terms of the city itself, and in terms of the governance, uh, I think that is evident evident for everyone uh, that a smart city is an ecosystem. It's an, an ecosystem that is better connected and that therefore is able to provide to everyone the possibility to participate in making the city better. Mm -hmm. Therefore, from my point of view, if uh, you want to implement a good plan for uh, a smart city, you have to take into account the interest, the views, the contribution of everyone. 
be industry, be uh, citizens, be startups, uh, be um, the, the city hall. And uh, my impression is that this participation has to be led by the city hall. So it is clear that those are the ones who have the responsibility of coordinating the interest of all the others. <clears throat> that is one thing. But the second thing, if we see, for instance, the situation in, uh, in Europe, there is a strong need to know what the other city is doing. I mean, you cannot work in isolation. You have to see what the others are doing, what works well and what works wrong. What are the possibilities even of creating this ecosystem that it will not be the ecosystem of the city, but the ecosystem of many cities there. Uh, and that is why the Commission is supporting this European Innovation Partnership, in which there is a strategic implementation plan. And there is also the commitment of today more than 300 cities that they have committed on implementing some plans with these views. So to me, um, first of all, the involvement of everyone in a city to create a smart ecosystem is key. And the second one is to learn from others. And the mechanisms that are put, for instance, from the European Commission to improve this communication about the cities, I consider that is very, very, very important. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now, I think we've got a few uh, moments for questions. Um, does anybody in the audience have a question for our panel? And we have somebody up here. Hi, my name is Mitzi Laszlo. I, I work as a neuroscientist. Um, have you considered any blockchain technology that would essentially remove the need for government or companies or any controlling organization? And how do you deal with the conflict of interest um, between these technologies essentially replacing politicians and employees? Um, also, the conflict of interest of data being valuable and it being a currency and it being an organization. That, you know, there's a, there's a money conflict here too. We would like I'll to take a Steve? Okay. Well, oh, sorry. No, no, please, Jesus. Well, <clears throat> just, it seems that I am making a lot of publicity for the European Commission, but I work there and I believe that the role that we are playing <laughs> is important. Um, I sympathize very much with the comments uh, that uh, you have made in the sense that they are, they, now there are technologies that allow for an alternative way of internet to work, in which the power is more distributed. And I think that the technology of big change is one that is uh, promising. Now, at this moment, in the research and development program of the Commission on ICT, there is one specific research objective on uh, uh, big change. Uh, therefore, we are at this moment uh, uh, exploring what is the potential for these distributed networks to provide better solutions and that they are perceived by the citizens as more participatory and in which they have more control on what is going on. So I think I consider that that uh, element is something that is at the level of research in many cases in terms of the application to the cities and that the European Commission is checking uh, very well the interest that they can provide as an alternative way of participation in, uh, in Internet. Mm. Steve, you wanted to come in on this one. So I, I don't see it in quite the same way. I see blockchain not replacing politicians mm. because forget about Singapore for a second, as generally relationship between people uh, and understanding people's needs and priorities and trying to think of programs and policies. I do think blockchain, and in Singapore we're working on blockchain as a way of considering how shares would be accounted for on a stock exchange. We're thinking about the role of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle relationships, so we think about different systems and the role that a blockchain would play, and then the thing that's obviously getting a lot of publicity, such as cryptocurrency. So we're thinking about the role of blockchain as a technology and how it can supplement or help. We don't think about it as helping us relate more effectively to people. So we think there's always going to be that person to person. But to answer the other question, Singapore has been trying to host some uh, innovation events that we include a number of countries in just thinking about what would blockchain look like as a way of thinking about systems. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have. Oh, you no, want no, to I, said, I said just a comment on this. I said I do not believe that uh, the the machines or the technology will, will replace, we will eliminate jobs. I mean, what maybe is to create different kind of jobs? You know, I, said, I think everything. We have a, a very interesting uh, uh, survey that uh, I don't know. Seven percent of the jobs to be created in the I don't know in ten years from now do not exist today. Now everything yeah. around big data, everything mm -hmm. around this. 
And, uh, and the same for me on the politician side. No, I think that uh, they also will be necessary. Again, a part of this uh, survey, we have been asking people who they believe should be leading this uh, smart seats uh, movement. No? And the great majority says it should be the seat house. They clearly identify this. This is not a national issue. This is not a regional issue. This is not a private sector issue. This, of course, how we have to participate. But the leadership have to come from the seat house. Yep. Uh, I'm going to move on because I think we've got time for one very quick question here. Okay, my name is Luciano Alakja from Brazil. I have two questions, one to Eduardo and another to Minerva. Uh, to Eduardo, uh, you are promoting uh, from Telefonica point of view the open platform. So how do you see uh, the uh, evolution of this kind of uh, idea outside Europe, for example, in Latin America, right? Uh, and the other for Minerva is the connectivity. So it's very interesting, the, the model in New York that was based on free Wi-Fi. So it's, it's a very interesting way because it uh, creates a free access to the citizens, uh, to services and also to the internet. So uh, what, what was the importance and how, what is the importance of having free connectivity to citizens? Okay, why don't I start and then you can answer your question. So, um, well, you know, uh, unlike many cities in Europe, in, the, in New York City, 22% of New Yorkers do not have access to the internet at home. And if you go below the poverty line, that number jumps to 36%. And most of those are disproportionately, you know, lower income, they're mobile dependent, and they may not even be able to afford a data plan. So for us, as we start to digitize government and deliver government services electronically, um, we want to be very mindful that we're also providing the access to those services. Imagine you're trying to look for a job and you cannot write your uh, CV. You're trying to do your homework and, you don't, and your parents um, don't have enough money to pay for internet access at home. So for us, when we think about the technological revolutions that have impacted New York City, running water, electricity, we think that internet access has that same import and is, a, and, is and should be treated like a utility that everyone can have access to in a kind of lifeline format. And you know, the Link NYC Wi-Fi, I mean, there have been many attempts to do free Wi-Fi on a municipal level, many of them have failed because they were not built around a sustainable model. This is just one option where you can use advertising to support that model. There, there are many others as well, you know, cooperatives. And, and in fact, we issued a call for innovations last uh, June, over which we received 69 different responses. How do we provide even more affordable or free access. And we asked the citizens, companies, policymakers to give us their ideas. We've taken those ideas and we're starting to um, build these neighborhood innovation labs next year to try out some of these ideas. So um, for us, uh, just in closing, I mean, the access to the internet has such tremendous impact, not only in developing countries, but also in places where it's, there is already this digital divide. And it's our responsibility to close that along with our electronic government policies. Mm, and that's, that's so enlightening to hear that, that figure on the digital mm. divide in, in, yeah. in a city like New York. Um, uh, Eduardo. About the, about the open platform, uh, we are, again, as I've already said, we are working uh, with the European Commission but uh, supporting this fiber platform. But we do not see this as a European solution. Now I see that this should be much broader. I see this like GSMA, you know, that's something that started in Europe, but have been uh, broadly you know, extended and have been maybe the, one of the reasons no, for, for the proliferation of the, of the, of the mobile phones. Uh, we have a seats in Brazil, we have a seats, I don't know, maybe we can... Mexico, uh, Mexico Chile. Chile, we have many cities working on this. And uh, again, we, are, we believe that this could be a solution, not only for European, but could be a worldwide solution. Well, sadly, I think we're out of time, but I'd just like to say a big thank you to our great uh, group of panelists here, and um, thank you, audience, for, uh, for listening in. Thanks thank a lot.